Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. I am delighted on this episode to be talking with someone who is, is the word legend okay? Is comics that's legend? been thrown around quite a bit lately, which I think once you're over 60, you just <laughs> it's par for the course. Hey, it, it works. It works. Uh, Richard Starkings, may I call you Richard? Sure. All right. All right. Um, I know your work best through, of course, uh, Comic Craft and the work that you did, especially on Batman, the animated series books, some of the the Batman books that were so popular in the 90s. Um, so I know those very well. But you're also currently creating in the world of Conan with Jim Zub. And you have so many titles that just continue on. And I love what you bring to the page visually and Thank creatively. You. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. And uh... Um, working on Conan the Barbarian has been a bit of a dream come true. And just the sort of, you can actually see on my wall here, these are commissions during the pandemic when I was at, at home, you know, wondering what to do. Um, <laughs> I did a number of commissions and Rob De La Tour had just started posting uh, Conan pieces that he'd drawn mm -hmm. and, I got in touch and commissioned him, never dreaming that he would work on the ongoing Conan title, which I did actually work on for 15 years mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when it was at Dark Horse. Kurt Busiek uh, brought me on board uh, when he took over the title when it moved to Dark Horse. And I had lettered two issues of the Marvel run, mm -hmm. uh, which were recently reprinted in the omnibuses. So... um. You know, it's interesting that Conan was the title that really hooked me into comics. Um, nice. it, you know, when I was a teenager, when I was reading the Robert E. Howard uh, reprints, um, which were published in England by Sphere Books and mm -hmm. had those beautiful Frank Frazetta covers. Um, and I had actually discovered a reprint of... Uh, issue five of Conan the Barbarian, drawn by Barry Smith. It's called Zucala's Daughter, or Zucala's Daughter. In the very first British Marvel annual published by Marvel UK, um, and uh, it's the first Conan comic I read, mm -hmm. and I read it, and I reread it, and I reread it. It was black and white, beautiful line work, so it was just pure Barry Smith artwork mm -hmm. um although i'm not sure if he wasn't inked by dan adkins at that time he may have been um and i just thought that was so beautiful you know yeah. so simple it was such a simple story about a girl you know trapped by her father who was a wizard and there's a demon at the end and she turns into a tiger and a <laughs> uh, very simple story but just so beautiful and masterfully drawn and i think then i probably read um, the British reprints of the Barry Smith stuff, which just was published as Conan the Barbarian uh, in, or maybe it was, no, it was reprinted as, confusingly, Conan the Barbarian was reprinted in England in Savage Sword of Conan, ah, okay. which was a weekly that ran for a couple of years, maybe a year before it folded into the Avengers, mm -hmm. the Marvel UK Avengers. Um. And I, I really just loved Barry Smith's Conan. And then I loved John Buscema's Conan. Um, and I read all the Robert E. Howard paperbacks. So, you know, when Titan got a hold of, well, actually, when Heroic Signatures um, were looking to create um, a new monthly, I actually hunted down the editor and I got, I got in touch with Rob because I knew he was drawing it mm -hmm. and uh, finally got a hold of Matt Murray on Facebook and, you know, basically said, you know, this is my dream book. How can I work on it? And uh, he signed me up and, um, you know, now Doug Braithwaite, who I've worked with since he was 15. Oh, Wow. <laughs> I hired him to draw uh, Thundercats at the recommendation of uh, both David Lloyd and Dave Gibbons. Um, so I've known him since he was a nipper. Uh, 
and he's doing absolutely beautiful lush work and and he i know to be a big john basama fan so we're all coming from the same adoration of that early work you know that was guided mm -hmm. by roy thomas in the 70s and just sort of had a magic about it i think whether it was barry smith or john basama um and i also was a big fan of uh, Savage Sword of Conan, which was imported into England. Even more confusingly, you could buy Savage Sword of Conan, the black and white Marvel US monthly, on the same rack as you bought the reprint Savage Sword of Conan, featuring reprints of Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> so you made a mess of our language, so we make a mess of your publishing schedule. There you go. That that totally works. Absolutely. <laughs> that language is that sort of thing. It really yes. is. It really is. Um, so it sounds like the, the connection to comics and the way that you decided that your work as a writer and artist was really sort of baked in to your reading life from, from very early on. Very, very early on, much earlier than, than Conan. Um, you know, I was very fortunate in, um, uh, my brother, my oldest brother is 12 years older than me. And he had a massive collection of Marvel and DC comics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would go and stay with him in, in school vacations and um, just burn my way through uh, his comic book collection. I, I remember taking half the run, the first 50 or 60 issues of Amazing Spider-Man, mm -hmm. putting them on his kitchen table and just reading through them when I was like 11 or 12. But before that, you know, uh, my mum always encouraged us to read. And if we read comics, then she would buy us comics. Yeah. So there was something called uh, Look and Learn, um, which had a great comic strip um, called The Trigon Empire. And because I see one on my shelf right now, I'm just going to grab it mm -hmm. to show you. Oh, these are being reprinted by Rebellion right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the work of Don Lawrence, who was just a masterful illustrator and an inspiration to many British illustrators. He actually trained Chris Weston, um, one of my old colleagues. Uh, Kev Hopgood was trained by Don Lawrence for a short while and Liam Sharp. And uh, there was two pages of this beautiful color artwork in Look and Learn every week. My mum was getting it for us because it was look and learn. So there was a lot of <laughs> science and geography and, you know, the story of uh, Jesus and just just many different um, uh, stories in there. It had beautiful covers. Ron Embleton, who was a great British comic book artist, did a lot of covers. Um, a lot of British, great British illustrators cut their teeth on look and learn. Um, and then when I was nine or 10, a comic called Countdown came out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that was attractive because it had Doctor Who, UFO, Fireball XL5, uh, to the Tomorrow People. And we're talking about illustrators like John M. Burns, who's another oh. British great, uh, um, Michael Noble, who who drew many, many different Jerry Anderson strips, uh, including Space 1999, Fireball XL5, Captain Scarlet, Frank Bellamy. Uh, there was work of his reprinted in Countdown. So there was just th this beautiful, you know, they were expected to produce two pages a week. Mm -hmm. So it was beautifully illustrated because they had a week to do two pages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the printing quality was very high on those uh, weeklies in those days. And then Lookin came out in the, around the same time, and that had comic strips by a lot of the same illustrators um, and uh, featured Time Slip, which was a British TV show, it, always sort of TV related. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't until later in life that I realized I didn't watch Tomorrow People but I read the comic strip because <laughs> I'm I'm definitely if I had to give up TV or comics, I'd give up TV every time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, illustration was so important to me. And, and when they reprinted those Robert E. Howard paperbacks without a Frank Frazetta cover, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. I am done. Um, 
so even my record collecting um i did one of those top 10 lists on facebook a couple of three years ago and all my top 10 albums had great illustrations on the cover armed forces by elvis costello which has the elephants mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on the cover uh war of the worlds which had a painting by i believe mike trim who did a lot of the designs for ufo and jerry anderson um, and I didn't even know that at the time. I didn't see the connection. I was just like, look at that illustration. Um, Out of the Blue by ELO, which had a beautiful painting of a spaceship. Um, Jerry Rafferty's City to City, which had this beautiful painting by an artist called John Byrne. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not the John Byrne, John Patrick Byrne. Ah, okay. And he illustrated most of Jerry Rafferty's album covers. Um even for the Humble Bums, which was a group that Joe Rafferty was in with Billy Connolly in oh. his in his young days. So illustration was so attractive to me that even when I didn't realize, uh, as a for instance, you know, I read the Dune books um, mm -hmm. when I was a teenager and Bruce Pennington did the illustrations of those covers and then I started reading uh, the Lucky Star series by Isaac Asimov, not realizing Bruce Pennington. So, so I was attracted to science fiction. I was attracted to, you know, the Tomorrow People, Doctor Who, and UFO, and so forth. But if it was illustrated, that that raised it mm. for me. You know, um, not to say I'm not a big Doctor Who fan. Not to say I'm not a big Dune fan. But the illustration. Uh, was definitely what magnetized me, whether it was to music. You know, in the 70s and 80s, a lot of the uh, movie posters were beautifully illustrated. Oh, definitely. You yeah. Know? So, um, yeah, I was. Ex I think I was just very lucky to be exposed to a lot of great art uh, as a teenager. And because of my brother, um, he, he had 7,000 comics in a room wow. in his house in nottingham <laughs> um and I've, I've said before that the marvel comics were on the lower shelves and i was oh. 10 i couldn't reach the dc comics which at that time he perceived as being more valuable uh -huh. because they were older they were like 50s and early 60s so he gave me complete access to marvel and that determined that i was more of a marvel fan mm -hmm. um than a uh, a DC fan because I just couldn't reach them. Yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. Uh, um, well, speaking of that, that draw to science fiction, uh, I recognize that affinity and the storytelling that you do in Elephant Men as well. And I'm curious about how that experience came together and as a mile marker, as a, as a writer on that series. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, um, I think Wikipedia will tell you that, you know, I, I came up with a mascot for the sale of the fonts, uh, which was hip flask. Um, uh -huh. And it's partly true because the, you know, I did, we were starting to sell fonts. Um, and, but always my concept of selling fonts was to create income that I could then spend on creating my own comic. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, because I had, the comics I read in my 20s were like Love and Rockets, Cerebus, and all the sort of indies who were, you know, under the banner of Fantagraphics or self-publishing were saying, well, why would you work for Marvel or DC when you can own and and publish yourself? You know, that was the that was when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was launched. That was when Creator Rights was sort of at the forefront of the conversation. Mm -hmm. in, in the 80s you know it's not a new thing image didn't invent it. it there were a lot of independent publishers who were creator owners you know and scott mcleod famously did a uh bill of creators rights mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. 80s also um when i was at marvel uk we played softball against 2000 ad mm. <laughs> and the captain of the 2000 ad softball team was john wagner who created uh -huh. George Dredd, Strontium Dog, Robo Hunter, you name it. All the great ongoing characters in uh, 
2000 AD. And he was sort of dour, jaded, cynical <laughs> creator who had regretted handing over the rights. At that time, he didn't have a share in Judge Dredd. Mm -hmm. And Alan Grant was his writing partner at that time. Alan was a uh, an assistant editor on 2000 AD, editor and writer. And they both were telling us, don't sell your characters to Marvel or DC. So that sunk in, mm -hmm. you know, and, and their unhappiness, I think, their sort of cynical, you know, I tried to get them to create a series for us. And if they didn't have any share in it, they weren't interested. Mm -hmm. So we, we didn't get to work with them. I didn't get to work with them. Um, so that that sort of sunk in. And also, I did, Alan Grant did want to work with us and was trying to, you know, pitch ideas independent of John. And we were having a conversation one day after a softball match. We were just sitting in Hyde Park on the grass, Regent's Park. And no, Hyde Park. Um, and uh, he'd, kept, he'd pitched a lot of ideas to me that I call quest stories. Mm -hmm. you know, when Frodo gets the ring, the quest is over, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Batman and Spider-Man carry the motivation internally. Yeah. Because, because they can never stop their parents or Uncle Ben from being killed, right? So they, they're trying to make amends. They're trying to alleviate their pain mm -hmm. for their entire life. Mm -hmm. So whereas if you get to the end of a quest, it's done. You know, um, I can't think of a modern example, but um, well, I can actually. Paris the Caribbean, he just wants the Black Pearl. Captain mm -hmm. Jack just wants the Black Pearl back, and then he's just going to go on pirating, right? Mm -hmm. But he does, but, but, and that's a sort of quest. So we sort of were talking about his ideas, and I said, it's, you know, I, I, I'd like a character like Spider Man, like Batman, that, you know, like Judge Dredd. And he, he said to me, well, I'm good at writing other people's characters like the ones that John created, but I don't I don't seem to be able to create them myself. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, interesting. So I left Marvel UK, so that became, you know, uh, irrelevant. But what Alan had said and that conversation we had about motivation stuck with me. And I think when when I finally came up with Hip Flask and the Elephant Man, I, I feel like I have characters that carry their motivation inside of them because they can't change who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, Ben Grimm in the Fantastic Four is probably the closest example to my character, Hip Flask, in that he can't change his likeness. And when he does, we want him to change back anyway. Mm -hmm. Right? So, um, and the Fantastic Four uh, is the most like a science fiction comic in the superhero world of Marvel, you know, so it, you know, again, I didn't realize this at the time, but I'm not a superhero fan per se, mm -hmm. but I used to love the fantastic four because they were more, you know, because of Reed Richards, they were sort of more science fiction based. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so because I worked on so many superhero comics, uh, and I've read a lot of superhero comics because what choice do you have? But, right. you know, Conan was the first comic that I got into, and that's science fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, Star Wars is science fantasy. Um, Blade Runner is my favorite movie. That's science fiction. Alien is a close second. Science mm -hmm. fiction. Mm -hmm. Doctor mm -hmm. Who, science fiction sometimes, science fantasy at other times. So it was very much to me, you know, when I started writing something all that science fiction that i'd absorbed reading dune reading asimov watching shows like twilight zone star trek etc you know it, it sort of it, it started bubbling out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know I, and i think we all do that i think we all try to write to ourselves when we're 12 right right we, we, we're trying to create the magic that made us start reading comics in the first place. 
Yeah. Um, and what I wanted to do, I don't think of myself as a writer as such. I think of myself as um, someone that likes to put together comics. Mm -hmm. If I have to write it, I'll write it. <laughs> you know, but I don't want to write Batman. So many people I meet in my industry have got this great Batman story they've always been dying to tell. And 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 I always feel, but they there are a thousand of them, haven't they already <laughs> told? You know. Right. And I recognize that, you know, there is that part of us. Like I love the new Indiana Jones film. Because mm -hmm. I'm one of those Indiana Jones films, which is like, just give give me one more. Right, I'm, right. <laughs> I want that Indiana Jones thrill. And I, I understand that as a consumer, but if you ask me to write an Indiana Jones story, I'd turn it into an Elephant Man story <laughs> halfway through. Recently, I was thinking of a Batman story to work on with my uh, co-creator of Ask for Mercy, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think she would draw a great Batman. And I got halfway into it and I was like, wait a minute, this is a great Ask for Mercy story. <laughs> you know, it's... Because why give it away? Why give it to someone that's going to say, you can't use this character. You can't set it in this era. You can't. It's such a long list of can'ts unless mm -hmm. you're, you know, Frank Miller or um, Sean Gordon Murphy or, you know, unless you're at that sort of um, writer artist level. Um, you know, I love I love seeing Jock draw Batman. I love seeing mm -hmm. Sean Gordon Murphy draw Batman. Um but I would much rather Jock did Gone. I'd much rather uh, Sean Gordon, Gordon Murphy did. Um, I'm trying to think of the thing that he he created himself because he's doing Zorro right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I'd I'd rather they did the create their own thing because then you're surprised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's new directions that can. Yeah, take you're place. surprised. No one tells me how to write Elephant Men, but mm -hmm. if I wrote Batman, there'd be a thousand people online telling me what I'm doing wrong. Right. <laughs> right. I never had anybody tell me what I'm doing wrong on Elephant Men uh, because I cre I created it. You know, yeah. you can't tell God you don't like one of their character, his characters. <laughs> true. Creating, you know. True, true. Yeah. Well, well, with the idea of creating in mind, I'm curious about you mentioned Ask for Mercy. Um, and I know that you're continuing to to work in the world of Conan and other books as well. So curious about anything that you might mention that's sort of on the horizon. Well, um, on the next horizon is oh, I, I've got a busy year next year because um, I'm working with Abigail Jill Harding on her creation parliament of rooks mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know comic craft is pu publishing that through comiXology um but we've talked about the next season of ask for mercy which we'll probably do as a kickstarter um we did four seasons uh with comiXology originals but we're not sure that that door is open but we we love those characters we created i i thought we were going to do one season and out Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we kept talking about every year we'd be like i've, I've got this this i've got this idea you know <laughs> and we have rich characters to explore and and again once you have characters you just need a story as a vehicle mm -hmm. and and because we had this sort of team a werewolf a indian shaman um you know a shapeshifter each one has a story um it's kind of like there's a tv show uh, British TV show called The Ghosts. Not uh -huh. the uh -huh. version. Uh -huh. And over five seasons, they have these six or seven ghosts and they tell you maybe two two origin stories in the first season, two in the third. Uh, and, you know, that's the great thing about an ensemble cast is mm -hmm. you can go in different directions with the different character stories. So we have a, a new story um for as for mercy which i sort of see as a um a series we can both come back to you know every couple of years um mm -hmm. it's definitely a team book um it's a little bit like the x files if mulder and scully were monsters you know so um there's that le drone who i've been working with believe it or not 23 years oh wow, wow. five issue series four of which have come out. 
he's two pages shy of issue five being finished, which is the end of the story. So we'll do that as a Kickstarter. We'll do a big collection of that next year. And that Elephant Men has been prologue to that story because of where characters are at the end of that story. I had to do a whole series that was prequel, uh, which was great to explore that world. Um, but not everybody survives that story. So I couldn't do a sequel without giving away story arcs. So um, that's coming together next year. Um, there is another Batman book, which I can't talk about, that I'm working on next year. Um, nice, nice. What's the other one? Um, I've been helping out a little with... Um, graffiti are doing a gallery edition of the killing joke which of course is a book oh, that i'm yeah. very closely associated with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and um what else oh you know i was very close to tim sale who mm -hmm. was the artist on long halloween and superman for all seasons and um i started putting together a little book i was going to do a 30 page sort of tribute to Tim because he did a few elephant men shorts for me. And I put them together for a magazine in England called shift, which had a cover by Tim. And I started thinking, well, why don't I self publish this through Amazon print on demand? Mm -hmm. And I thought it'd be like a 30 page book. He and I were working on what would have been a creator owned project called the broken mm -hmm. man. And he had done some breakdowns for that. And we'd had a lot of back and forth about it. So my little 30 page book turned into this hundred page oh, wow. um, uh, sort of epilogue to the book we did together called Tim Sale Black and White. It's sort of what, what Tim wanted to do was a noir comic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was creating a story with him that was in that world. I don't think Tim ultimately had the confidence to do something create around. And, and if he was sitting here with me now, he'd say that's true. Um, but he wanted to, um, and we got close. Um, and he did little things in solo for DC that were along those lines. So I, I have this book that will eventually, it'll be a Kickstarter as well. Um, and there'll be, you know, some little collaborations. Uh, a couple of artists that I work with have finished um, breakdowns that Tim did. And it, they're fragments. You know, it's it's not a complete work. But um, it sort of came out of the blue sky earlier in this year and should be out by the end of next year. Uh, well, Richard, you are a busy busy person you have lots Ahem. of irons in the fire <laughs> yep. yeah well, well looking forward to all of the work to come all of the work to come um and i appreciate the time you've spent with me today talking about you're very welcome thanks for um work. yeah thanks for um you know thinking of me and asking those questions it's always i, I think it's always interesting everybody comes at creativity creativity from different directions and i think sometimes we expect everyone to have come from the same direction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and i think it's always interesting to find out you know the whys and wherefores so yeah yeah and, and great to meet you great to connect and glad to have you back anytime sure let me know all right